Welcome back to the Crypto Assets Conference 2021A. My name is Marcel Kaiser and we will continue with our current section on regulation, politics and the future of payment infrastructure. As the next speaker, please welcome Dr. Joachim Schwerin and he will give a presentation on the future of the token economy in Europe. Enjoy. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I hope that uh, from the technical side, everything works well. I've shared my slides and I will start my slideshow imminently. First of all, however, uh, I'm really excited to form again part of this uh, conference. I've heard the first two days and basically we've touched nearly everything that is currently a hot topic in the domain. I will spend my 15 plus minutes to, well, scratch a bit on the surface because uh, speaking of such a broad topic like the token economy in Europe, of course, I cannot go into all of the details, but I'll try to pick up as much as possible from the previous discussions. Now, what excites me when I listen to all of what you have been talking about so far is, of course, the level of innovation, the excitement of combining all the various factors that play a role here, the various business models that really now are ever faster and faster evolving. On the other hand side, from a public policy perspective for us, it's very important to take a look at where is the practical value of all these things. I completely share the excitement that uh, from the technological side, it's fascinating to look into all the details. It is immensely rewarding to uh, check out cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, and see uh, how that works. But at the end of the day, we are responsible for bringing benefits to the economy, to the society, to every citizen. And 98% of our enterprises in Europe are small and medium-sized enterprises, the large majority of them very small and not high-tech. And we need to make sure from a public side, when we spend resources, time, labor, money, that the benefits reach those people, those enterprises that form the majority also of our uh, space. And within that group of SMEs, actually, it's 4% of high-growth enterprises, which are mostly small, medium-sized enterprises that create 80% of the new jobs in Europe. So from that perspective as well, I think uh, I will focus a little bit on them because we need to create the framework conditions to make them successful. Now, when I talk about tokenization and the token e economy, for me, this is a very, very positive development, as I've mentioned many times before, and I see a lot of opportunities, which I've tried to summarize in this little slide here. We started, from my perspective, with SME financing. We went through all the pipeline of developments over the last couple of years. We also had the social aspect, which already has been there before from the crowdfunding uh, times and uh, inclusive finance initiatives, etc., which we think is a game changer in terms of tokenization that we have fully decentralized and inclusive space. We also see it from a macroeconomic perspective, and that relates to discussions such as the digital euro that we had earlier today on global competitiveness, not only for SMEs, not only for crowdsourcing value chains of inputs, etc., but also, of course, uh, the question of global currencies, the role of the euro as such. The whole topic of programmable money, tokenized ecosystem, as I've mentioned, digitalization of industries. And that actually was interesting to hear from the previous panel. For me, is the key question at this very moment. We have an immense amount of interest in cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, stable coins, et cetera, in the DeFi space, in other areas. But it seems, and I disagree with that, uh, relatively little demand from industry. Now, my experience, in a sense, is the opposite, but that's not a contradiction. There is immense interest of the industry, of the ecosystems, of many small and medium-sized enterprises in the pipeline, but they find it at this moment difficult to further develop their ideas, to scale up, to go into the next level of their production, of their dissemination, etc. And this is where all the measures that I will be shortly talking about come into play. Example, I just mentioned digital finance for SMEs. This was for us in the European Commission the starting point about 10 years ago in the financial crisis in the aftermath thereof to look for alternatives to bank financing. We came to alternative finance, crowdfunding, the first digitalization, blockchain, etc. I don't need to repeat that. But the bottom line for us is that this digital finance is the starting point for what we call the democratization of finance in an inclusive and bottom-up manner, which leads us to the token economy. And this is something where I very strongly believe in because this is completely different to what we see in other parts of the world, this bottom-up approach. Other parts of the world, we have either government-steered uh, or big-tech-steered 
top-down approaches that basically implement their visions of life to our citizens, to our entrepreneurs. We take the different approach, which takes more time, which is more difficult in a sense to achieve in a consensual way, but we think it's the more lasting way. So when I talk about the token economy, I basically mean this. Now, recently, uh, we have more focus on industrial applications. We started that three or four years ago. We had a very interesting blockchain, uh, another hashtag blockchain for EU, where we looked at prototypical blockchain applications for various industrial sectors. In this study, from which this graph originates, we had nine different sectors. My point here when I speak about the token economy is the following. What we see at this moment is myriads of initiatives at the local, at the regional level, small scale, decentralized to have very good, fantastic ideas on how to implement the technology, how to develop use cases, uh, how to move forward. But these things are not connected. And we need many things to connect them. So our vision, which we are implementing into our policies, to which I'm coming in a moment, is to look at those factors that not only help to innovate, not only help to scale, but also help to integrate these various ecosystems into a coherent ecosystem, which I display on this graph here, which makes it interconnected. And this means that, for example, topics like standardization at the moment are very high on our political agenda because we need, together with uh, the market, together with the industrial players, develop a set of standards, for example, interfaces that respect the values that we have in our societies and that are reflected in our policies. And I'll skip this uh, slide for a moment for time reasons. This leads to a completely different approach where we see ourselves as a company industry and the ecosystem and not as presenting, as I said, top-down the solutions. And this to me is the bottom line when I now come in the rest of the presentation to most of our policies. In the past, and this is another of my key messages today, and this is a message that I always give to every politician, to all the regulators, etc., we are living in a new era. In the past, even 10 years ago, when we had 75% of finance for SMEs to the banking sector, when we had the big corporates that have always been the target of our regulation, we had still the possibility to do a sort of top-down approach. We had mature markets, limited number of incumbents, very few new competitors, small pace of incremental innovation, regulation in long cycles, and it was possible to take years for regulation. Now we are living in a completely different paradigm. We have emerging markets. We have not yet established incumbents. They are emerging, but not like in past times. Many new competitors, very disruptive innovation, and the innovation, and that is the key point, outpaces regulation. So whatever you see in terms of our proposals, in terms of our regulation, you need to be aware that they are to be understood as a sort of umbrella. We cannot fine-tune a regulatory approach to each and every part of the innovation space in crypto because that would completely outstretch our resources, but it would also be stupid. It would be stupid because we will never catch up with the uh, pace and therefore we have to found our policies on some sound principles that apply to everyone. And I hear, for example, very often the question about what about regulation and DeFi now you have Mika, and I come to that point very briefly if there's time. That's the same point in time. We will not have a Mika regulation every year. We have Mika now. We have to fine tune it. We have to improve it. But this is, in a sense, the framework in which we live, whether it is stable coins, whether it is DeFi, utility tokens, or whatever we have in the domain. Very briefly on where we come from and where we go. We have in the past, and I've stressed that very often, and I won't repeat it too much here, emphasized already five years ago that for us, blockchain is an absolute game changer, not only in finance, not only for industry, but in every policy domain. And we have therefore designed the instruments, the organizations, the workflows to really see blockchain or distributed ledger technology in general as a breakthrough technology like artificial intelligence, like others that will make Europe more competitive, hopefully. And then we went through all the channel that you know very well from the FinTech Action Plan to all the measures that I've listed on the slide from the Blockchain Observatory. We've helped create INATPA, European Blockchain Partnership, European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, etc. And now, since last year, we have again stepped up the pace. And I would like to keep this here for a moment, uh, open this page here, because it, you might feel it is a little bit unrelated to the topic, but for us, it's the essence. The starting point is that all our 
policy measures really need to be connected around the same core principles. And when we came with the digital package early last year, it was mostly about not only our digital future in general, but about data. We had a European strategy for data, and later this year we will come hopefully with the Data Act, which is currently being planned, where we go much more into the details. And our starting point on data fully reflects on what we have been discussing previously, namely that we take this approach from bottom up. Your data are your property. Every citizen, every enterprise owns their data. And if anyone wants data for any purpose, you need to give consent to have these data used. And this is the core of everything that we are discussing. It's the same about all other activities actually that are built on data or whatever else in the crypto space that you as an individual, as a citizen, as an enterprise are the starting point of the activity. And therefore, it needs to be enabled and not prohibited that basically you do with that what is according to your values, your objectives personally, of course, given that it fits into the broader framework of our societies. We have then, as a second step, a month later, adopted an SME strategy, where we looked at these 98% of enterprises that I've just mentioned. And we had a couple of blockchain-related actions in this action plan. And basically, they relate on two things which are very important to me. And it's very timely that we have it here in the Frankfurt School that we discuss this topic here, because you will see that the first of that relates to skills. It relates to education. And this is, to me, an extremely important part of the whole discussion here. And it is in part a reply, an answer to the question at the beginning of how is there so much interest in all these crypto matters? Why is there so much activity in the crypto space, but at the end of the day, so little real activity in our industrial ecosystems? And the missing link is the education. The missing link is the development of skills at a broad scale on how to use these things without really everyone, of course, needing to understand how blockchain works in detail. I don't know how my smartphone works. So at the end of the day, people don't need to work, need to know how blockchain as such works, but it needs to be applied in a concrete environment. And therefore, our main initiative, which we've now stepped up, I come to that, is capacity building, is education. And the second is access to finance, which in a broad sense is also access to market, access to customers, access to new ways of promoting your business. And we take the philosophy that in the future, with a minimum of intermediaries needed, it is the enterprise as such, which is the core entity to design their financial instruments to design their way of doing finance and uh, set financial instruments with a certain hesitation because that would relate to MIFID, of course, in a sense, but I mean the issuance of crypto assets, which are not MIFID, which are MICA, and then uh, would fit to the very concrete needs of that enterprise. MICA being mentioned, later last year, we came with the digital finance strategy with all the things that you know, MICA, the sandbox, a lot of amendments, our cybersecurity uh, package, uh, our strategy on retail payments, which is very important and will probably be discussed uh, later today here, and a number of other things, including some preparatory work for the digital euro. And this, again, reflects the principles. And I hear a lot of criticism about the MICA regulation, which I fully understand. A MICA regulation was being developed in a very short time frame, and it was developed in a novel way. So it looks like old regulation, but it is not because it has certain values embedded which uh, make it different from the traditional uh, field. For example, when you issue a crypto asset, they are not financial instruments. The white paper is not a prospective, uh, not a prospectus. You have the possibility of doing principally what you would like to do as long as it fits the requirements. So in a sense, it's not correct that we are prohibiting any sort of stable. Coin. It is just that we have very clearly, and it's a long list, I concede that, uh, tried to establish the criteria which make it possible for you to enter the European space, and then you are passported throughout the European Union. And that, of course, then creates additional issues like has been discussed before when you look at, for example, the reserves and the role of the euro. Uh, Philip and I, together with a couple of uh, very experienced experts, will discuss in an event uh, next week. And I hope that then we have the ability to go more into details. But at the end of the day, it's a calibrated risk-based approach. 
And what I would like to stress when I talk about Mika is really that we have three pillars. And the first pillar is very often forgotten. We have the crypto assets, the utility uh, tokens, uh, which will become more important, as the speaker before me has correctly uh, mentioned. We have the whole discussion on the stable coins and e-money tokens, but we also have a large area of exemptions. And these exemptions allow a lot of activity to take place, actually completely unregulated. So basically, you have the regulations saying that all these things, the smaller projects, the cryptocurrencies, etc., are unregulated. Of course, civil law applies, but not then the regulation as such. And this, I find a liberal step forward, which is indeed in line with our principles. Now, to conclude the last probably two minutes uh, that are there, we come up now with additional stuff. First of all, very recently, we have adopted a communication on the what we call the European way for the digital decade, which includes digital compass. And the digital compass is a vision combined with concrete targets that we develop for the next 10 years where we would like to deliver. And that is around four areas. Skills, again, then the role of government, the role of infrastructure, and what we can do for businesses. And skills, we have very clear targets. 20 million of ICT specialists by the end of the decade, difficult to achieve if that is meaningful. More gender convergence, which is, for example, very important for the Frankfurt School. I know that because you have this excellent initiative of bringing more female participation to blockchain, which I welcome very much, but also a very broad application of digital skills in the population, including things like identity management and other things which are extremely important. And actually later this week, we will come with a proposal of a digital identity wallet that has already been discussed to a certain extent uh, in the media. And that addresses part of these issues here. For reasons of time, I don't go into the details any longer. You can read that in the communication. Uh, My last remark is basically that then, earlier last month, we have lived up to part of that again in looking more again at the industrial ecosystems to accelerate together the green and digital transition. And we are doing that in 14 ecosystems, which basically represent all our industries. And the key point to this is when you look at what we propose as 14 industrial ecosystems, There is also one ecosystem, which is the digital ecosystem, but digital plays a role in each ecosystem. For example, in tourism and all the others that I mentioned on this slide, and tourism is actually, for obvious reasons, this summer one of the first where we deal with digital pathways. So the objective is to look at how can we digitize all these sectors, and digitalization includes the skills, includes the finance, includes the access to markets, and includes everything that we have in terms of tokenization as such. We are concretely working on this, and we are making a number of proposals in the course of this year. So you see that this agenda is very full. At the end of the day, what we want to achieve is an integrated token economy, where, as has been mentioned before in the conference and also discussions today, we want to have all these machines tokenized. We want to have them interconnected. We want to have them working on an infrastructure that is openly accessible to everyone, and that is throughout all the sectors of the economy. And for us, It's really about tokenizing the rights, having a programmable digital money, having the digital identities in place according to context, so not one fits for all, but for different purposes, but in line with the values I've tried to discuss, privacy, data protection, our bottom-up approach, which is the fundamental, I would say, from a democratic perspective on the token economy. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. I hope I've sticked more or less to time, and I'm happy if there's time to take questions. Thank you.